Matthew chapter 27. Uh, turn there f for me, and uh, we're going to look at a very significant passage of Scripture this morning. I, uh, I heard the story of a gentleman who thought he was very, very handsome. Um, as a matter of fact, he was so conceited that he would wake up and he would look at himself in the mirror and he would just be overwhelmed every morning as to how great he looked. And so he decided that others should enjoy it, not just in physical presence, but even if he were not around, a portrait of him should be hung uh, in his office in case someone came in and they would see his face and they would also be overwhelmed with his, um, uh, his beauty, I guess. And so he decided he was going to have a portrait made and he was going to hang this in his, uh, in his office. And so he got all dressed up and he just got the best suit he had and he put it on and he went in to get his uh, uh, portrait made, and he told the photographer, he said, listen, this is extremely important. This side is my best side. So you make sure you get this mostly in the portrait because this is my best side, and you better do me justice. And the photographer said, sir, forgive me for saying this to you, but you don't need justice, you need mercy, right? <laughs> Who can relate? Anybody else have a face for radio? Yeah, I do. For sure. So I can relate justice and mercy. Well, this morning we're going to look at a, a, a very significant passage, and it's a passage that has justice and mercy sort of uh, tied to it. And it's a passage that tells us the story, the historical event of the greatest trial in human history, Jesus on trial. Matthew 27, 11 through 26 will be the passage that we read and that we work through this morning, but it is one of the most important sections, not only in the gospel, but in the entire Bible itself, because it is the trial uh, that was before the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. This trial preceded the most important event in human history history. And the very fact that Jesus is in a courtroom, I mean, think about that, Jesus on trial. The very fact that Jesus is in a courtroom poses the question, it forces the question, is he a menace, a threat to Rome, a threat to Judaism, a threat to the world, a threat to the people around him? Is he a menace or is he Messiah? And so Matthew 27 records a brief section of his trials, but in fact, Jesus endured six trials and in those six trials, in the middle of them, he endured mocking, he endured beatings, he endured scourging, and it, all that happened before a nail ever pierced his flesh. And so before we get to this section in Matthew, let's just go do an overview of the six trials that Jesus went to. The night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was first taken to the house of Annas, the former high priest. We see this in John 18. Even though Annas was deposed in A.D. 15, he still held a, a significant amount of, of influence among those ruling in Israel's council. Jesus was taken to his house first so that his son-in-law, the high priest Caiaphas, had time to call a council together for a second trial in the middle of the night. This is Matthew 26. Caiaphas was the official that the Romans appointed to be the high priest, and he strongly opposed Jesus' ministry. As a matter of fact, if you travel with us to Israel, we're going to go to Caiaphas' house, and we'll go down into this sort of dungeon, if you will, where Jesus is, was held, uh, was, is believed to be held through the night as they performed this trial. The next morning, a brief third trial was held to affirm the verdict that was passed the night before because it was illegal to have a trial at night. If you really study the trial of Jesus, as a matter of fact, there are books out there where attorneys and judges have sort of studied the trial and they found all kinds of discrepancies. And if you read through it, you'll see uh, a lot of shady things happening in an effort to get rid of this man, Jesus. The Jews then brought Jesus before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, if you'll remember, because they didn't have the authority to execute people. You see that in John 18 as well. 
When Pilate realized that Jesus was from Galilee, that's outside of his jurisdiction, he sent him somewhere else. He sent, them, sent him to Herod because this is uh, Herod's jurisdiction. And so in, in one sense, he's sort of relieved because he didn't have to deal with this uprising and all this chaos. But Herod, when he saw Jesus, he was really excited. He wanted Jesus to perform miracles, but Jesus wouldn't comply. But he also knew, just like Pontius Pilate, he knew that Jesus was sort of a hot topic. This was a political sort of nightmare for him. And so what did he do? He sent him back because he was dealing with the backlash of, of executing John the Baptist. And so he didn't want to add this Jesus to his plate as well. And in him sending him back to Pontius Pilate, we find ourselves in Matthew 27, the sixth trial that Jesus went through. And a lot of times we see Jesus and we think of Jesus on the cross and, and man, but, but all these things leading up to it was exhausting. And in the midst of all of that, being ridiculed and mocked and beaten and thrown into a cave uh, uh, overnight as people decided his faith. This is a very, very significant trial of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 27, I want to point out a couple of things about this trial, and then I want us to talk about what this means for us. Matthew 27, the first thing that I want to point out to you is a question that everyone must answer. Look at verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Now think about that question. Are you the king of of the Jews. This is a significant question. Pontius Pilate doesn't, he doesn't even understand the significance of that question. His question is not uh, driven by a desire to find out if he's a Messiah or not. He wants to know, does he see himself as a king? What he's really asking is, do you pose a threat to the Roman Empire? But we know there's so much more significance to that question. I mean, that is the question that everyone must answer as it pertains to Jesus. You have to do something with Jesus. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about significant questions in a person's life. And all of you have had significant questions in your life, like a question like, will you marry me, right? It's a significant question. And so I was just thinking about my life today, and I wonder if you were to just sort of describe your life in a series of questions, what would those questions be? In a series of significant questions, what would those questions be? And I was thinking about my life, and here are some questions that could define my life in the season I'm in. How much does that cost? <laughs> significant question. How many of you asked that in the last couple of weeks? Yeah. What about this? After my last doctor's visit, how many calories are in that? <laughs> Significant question. What time will you be home? Pretty important question, right? What were you thinking? <laughs> Ask that question. How many have asked that question recently? Yeah. About yourself or the people around you? What did I do? <laughs> I ask that question a lot. Significant questions. Yet the most significant question in human history is the question, who is Jesus? And all the questions that make up your life, the most important question a person will ever answer is what they believe about Jesus. Because we believe that 100 years from now, all that's going to matter is? So Jesus answered. Go back to the text. You say so. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he didn't answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear how much they're testifying against you? But he didn't answer him even one charge so that the governor was quite amazed. Jesus is being silent. He's not responding to the question, are you the king of Jews? They're accusing him of blasphemy. And the governor wants to know, where do you say, what do you say about yourself, Jesus? Is this true? Is this charge enough to end your life? But ultimately, Jesus has already answered the question, hasn't he? As a matter of fact, Isaiah 53, in Jesus' silence, he's answering the question. Isaiah 53, verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to a slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. His silence is answering the question. 
And yet the people that should know Isaiah 53, they're the ones that are throwing him uh, to the wolves, if you will, for the purpose of crucifying him. But not only that, his life answered the question. Think about the miraculous birth of Jesus and who he is, these miraculous predictions, this fulfilling of prophecy. He comes from the seed of a woman, Genesis 3.15, seed of Abraham, Genesis 12.1, tribe of Judah, Genesis 49.10, line of David, 2 Samuel 7.12, born of a virgin, Isaiah 7.14, born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, the time of his triumphal entry and death, Daniel chapter 9. He has already answered the question, amen? He also confirmed that he's the son of God just by the miraculous life that he lived, performing over 60 confirming miracles. He's answered the question. Norman Geisler rightly said about Jesus, his character was impeccable, his deeds were unimpeachable, his life is unsurpassable. And so while he's asking the question, Jesus is silent, he's ultimately already answered the question. And so, as we look at this trial, we see this question that everyone must answer. What do you believe about Jesus? That question is posed to you this morning. What do you believe about Jesus? Messiah? Menace. The famous line is liar or lunatic. Or savior. What do you believe about Jesus? The second thing I want to point you to is a rejection that everyone is guilty of. Go to verse 15. At the, fest, at the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who is it that you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with this righteous man, for today I've suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you, Barabbas they answered. Pilate asked them, what should I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? They all answered, crucified him. Then he said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood will be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. A rejection from the people. An acceptance of his blood will be on our hand. Now, notice in this trial, um, Pontius Pilate and his wife both admit he's righteous and he's not guilty of anything. But Pontius Pilate hands him over anyway. That's a rejection of an innocent man. And then here is this crowd who rejects Jesus over a known criminal, Barabbas. And the truth is, when we read this story, there's a lot to unpack, but ultimately, we find ourselves in this story. You see, the truth is, is that we are guilty because we are sinners. This is a rejection that every human at some point in their life are born to sort of have. This nature of sin that's given to us from Adam, we're born with this nature to reject Christ. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man centered into the world and death through sin, so all of us sin because we have this sinning nature. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We see ourselves in this story. A nature bent to reject. And so because this is true, that means that we're all on trial in a sense. When you read this story, you find yourself in it, and you, you have to place yourself on trial. Are you guilty or are you innocent? 
And the very fact that Jesus is the Messiah does put every human born on trial. Why? Because we're cut from the same cloth as those standing in the crowd saying, crucify him. We're cut from the same cross as, as Pilate who turned over an innocent Jesus to the crowd to be crucified. We're cut from the same cloth as Peter who denied Jesus in the courtyard of Caiaphas' house. We all find ourselves in this story. And so the verdict for us, the verdict is, is that we are guilty. We're guilty. We have a nature that's been imputed to us, this imputed unrighteousness passed down from Adam to us with a bent to reject Jesus in our lives. There's a rejection of Christ when it comes to salvation, a rejection of Christ when it comes to his deity. And as Christians, as we walk and live in this world, we find ourselves at time uh, bending the knee, if you will, to sin and rejection, needing for us to repent and come back. This is sort of the ry rhythm that we live in. Rejecting Jesus in our life, rejecting Jesus as Savior, Rejecting Jesus as Messiah and just tossing him over to be some crazy person. And so the question is, is what answer do you have when it comes to what you believe about Jesus? And as a guilty person, as someone who needs Jesus, we need to have an answer sufficient enough to make us right before God. And so what is the answer? The answer is... We have a rescuer. The answer is we have a redeemer. The answer is we have a reconciler, an advocate, Jesus Christ, the Savior of our souls. When you say that you believe Jesus is king and that he is Lord, you are saying that Jesus dying on the cross rescued you, redeemed you, reconciled you. Now Jesus is an advocate for you on behalf of God. You stand. He stands between you and a perfect Savior, And so here we go again in this passage with a parallel of, of salvation, a picture for all of us. Barabbas was a known notorious sinner who deserved death. You and I are born with that nature cut from the same cloth. But listen to this, Jesus died in his place. And because Jesus died in his place, listen to this, Barabbas lived. Because Jesus dies for you, a known notorious sinner to the heavenly realms, you will live. And we see ourselves in this story. That's the message of the cross. It's the point of the cross. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the truth that sets us free. And when you say you believe Jesus, you are saying you believe that the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus has saved you from your sins and set you free to live in Christ. And at the right time, Christ died in our place so that we would have forgiveness of sins and the gift of everlasting life. Romans 5, 6 and 8, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or Romans chapter 6, verse 33, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the choice is ours. As we answer the question, who is Jesus? The choice is ours. Do you believe that Jesus is redeemer, reconciler, an advocate? Do you believe that Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection is enough to make you right before God? Which then answers the question, are you the king of the Jews? The answer is yes. The choice is yours. Acts 16, 30, 31 says, believe in Jesus and you will be saved. And so when we read the trial of Christ, yes, it's a, it's a significant trial. It is the trial that leads up to his death, his burial, his resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. And we could read that trial and we can find ourselves in it and we can even see a sense of sort of, uh, um, 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 of humility we read it and there's somewhat of a sense of sadness. Why? Because he's innocent and he's right. 
But when we really dig into this trial and we start to see the purpose of it, we can't help but say, God, thank you. Because in the midst of this trial, all the while, there is God working, plotting, and planning for what? The redemption of mankind. The only way you are right before God is Jesus dying, Jesus being buried, Jesus coming out of that grave, and you believing in it. And in doing so, you will be saved. You'll be saved because of his life and what he's done for you. And so when you read the trial of Christ and all the events that follow, the word grace pours out because he did die for us. And so what I want to do this morning is, is quickly go through this, but I wanted to give you a moment to think through your own salvation. I don't know when the last time you actually sat down and just sort of remembered or thought through your story, what Jesus did for you, the season that you were saved, the moment that you were saved. But listen, I, I know this to be true. There are times we need to be reminded of that and we need to think on that. Because it's in that that we're reminded that, man, listen, we've, got, we've been given life. And it's been, it's been given to us because of grace. And some of you this morning need to be reminded of that. And so here's what I want you to do. You can just close your Bibles. Just bow your head, close your eyes just for a moment. And here's what I want you to do. How will you, I want you to think about when Jesus saved you. I want you to think about where you were, what you were doing. I want you to think about this, this, this prayer that even David prayed, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Because here's what I know about life, and I know you know this about life. Life has a way, this side of heaven, of just sucking the joy out of you, doesn't it? And Christians aren't exempt from the lifiness of life. And sometimes we need to be reminded of the joy that's been given to us in our own salvation. And so you just take a moment and you just think about your own salvation. You think about where you were, the season that you were in, who was preaching, what was going on in your life. And pray that prayer, Lord, just restore to me this morning the joy of my salvation. Take a moment and do that. Now, I want to encourage you to share that story this week. Tell somebody about what Jesus has done for you. Let this trial that Jesus goes through for the purpose of salvation, let it fuel you to tell other people about Jesus. You know, when I was saved, I wasn't pursuing God at all. As a matter of fact, I was living in, uh, I was in uh, 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 Baton Rouge, living with a bunch of friends in an apartment and not pursuing God at all, but God pursued me, and I'm so thankful for that. And it's a story worth telling, and you should tell that story, your story, to as many people as you can. The reason Christ died for you is so that you'll be saved, and you've been saved to a purpose, and that purpose is to point people to reconciliation, to show people that they need a redeemer, an advocate, a reconciler, and that is Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning when you bowed your head and closed your eyes and, and thinking of a story, you couldn't think of a story. You couldn't think of a time or a season when you were saved, when God changed your life, when you believed in Jesus. Well, if you couldn't think of a story, you couldn't think of a season, you couldn't think of a time where God changed you, well, listen, I want to invite you this morning. I want to invite you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Let today be the day of that story so that the next time someone asks you that story, you can say, I remember it was on a Sunday morning that Gideon guy talked, the pastor got up and talked, and he gave an invitation, 
And I responded and gave my life to Jesus and believed in the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of sin. Today is the day for salvation for you. That's how you respond this morning. And you can respond and you can do a couple of things. In just a moment, we're going to pray, we're going to sing, uh, we're going to respond in worship. And then we're, we're going to be dismissed. Don will come up, give us some parting words, and then we'll be dismissed to go to our community groups. And listen, if you want to talk to someone this morning about putting your faith and trust in Jesus, I'll be right down front. Would love to talk to you. Would love to, to, to talk to you about salvation. Um, um, you can even fill out one of those Connect With Us cards. You can write on the back, I need a pastor or minister to call me. We'll call you. But I want to encourage you to do something this morning with what you've heard. Christians, be encouraged of your own story and what Christ has done for you. Be reminded and let it be fuel this week to tell someone else about Jesus. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, then I want to invite you to come. I'm going to pray. Our guys are going to come up. They'll lead us in worship, and then you respond. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you. We do thank you. And God, I do pray that, Lord, if there's any person this morning that's never put their faith and trust in you, they, they couldn't remember a story. Lord, I pray this morning they'll, they'll respond. They'll do something. And God, for Christians, that we'll make a fresh commitment to go out into our community to tell other people about Jesus. Be reminded of what Christ went through so that we could be made right. So we could be reconciled back to you. And God, you didn't do that for no reason. You did it because you love us and you did it because you wanted us to go and share it. There's purpose that we've been saved to. And so, Lord, I pray today that we're reminded of that and that we're challenged to share that. And, Lord, I do pray that as Christians we'll be reminded of the joy that we have in salvation, especially in a world that seems to be falling apart around us, that we'll never lose sight of what you've given us. We have hope. We know that, that ultimately, Lord, you're coming back. And when you come back, all things will be made right. And you've given us that hope to cling to and to look to and to work in as we navigate the realities of this broken world. And so, Lord, I do pray for response this morning for those that have never put their faith and trust in you. They'll be bold and they'll do something this morning. For Christians, will walk out of these doors and they'll be committed to sharing their story with those who are close to them but far from you. God, we love you. We thank you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?